I'm glad I have another mic on my lapel. Well, good morning. We do have guests in our audience. We're grateful for that, and we uh, really appreciate you coming our way. Uh, look, look at your, your bulletin, the uh, Vacation Bible School on the front. Uh, we're going to be doing a little bit different format this year, uh, different days and so on. And Stephanie really uh, is doing a good job of putting together uh, the format. But she's going to need helpers. And there are some uh, questionnaire things that, that need to be filled out. We are asking, there's a lot of different areas in which you can help. So please uh, see Stephanie or pick up one of the little forms out front. Get that to her today so she can continue to plan uh, for these, uh, for the VBS July, beginning July 28th. Also, some important event. I really appreciate the work and the effort that the, I know how much uh, time it takes to put together uh, uh, when you start searching for a minister and our committee has done a, a great job. And so we've got two young men coming in with their families. Uh, the outlines uh, are in your bulletin, so I'm not going to go over those. So, uh, but be uh, available whenever you can to participate in and your your participation is helping him interview us I mean we're not just interviewing these candidates they are interviewing us as well and so we need to be there when we can be there to meet with him get to know him and, and his family uh, so that uh, we can determine who the best man for the job would be and the best man for the job is, is God's man. We want it to be God's choice. But he's going to work through us to see that, it, we, that we get the family minister that we need here. And we do need someone to come and develop a program for uh, our families and to develop a, uh, really also to develop a sliding scale of, of uh, working me out of this pulpit. Now, I, I'm not wanting to leave, and I'm not leaving right away. Whatever is worked out, it's going to be over a two or three or four year period. We don't know yet how that's going to work. But uh, he needs to be someone who, who is organized, someone who can work with people, someone who has a heart for people and a heart for the church, someone who has a heart for souls, and someone who com can communicate uh, as a teacher and as a, as a speaker from the pulpit. So this is the kind of man we want, and uh, we want you to be a part of that selection process. All right, we're continuing now in our studies on uh, how to rejoice, to be joyful. And uh, we've talked a, about a lot of subjects, and I hope that you're not getting tired of of hearing uh, what I've had to say on this, but, but Philippians is such a rich book, and, and it's so uh, so important for us to 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 get a grasp on that. I, I think I've told you before, but uh, several months ago, Rita came to me and said, uh, "We need something to tell us about being upbeat and happy." And so, after several of these, I I said, "Well, Rita, is this what you had in mind?" And she said, yeah, but I'm ready for a hellfire and brimstone sermon now. <laughs> so uh, uh, bear with me. We'll, we'll get there, Rita. But we're going to get through uh, some of these other lessons as, as well. So today we're going to be talking about complaining, complainers, grumbling, murmuring, the Bible talks about. And if you want, if there's anything that will kill joy... It's complaining, isn't it? It makes you unhappy and it makes the other people all around you unhappy as well. So why do we do it? I, I think it's a, a habit and, and habits are hard to break. And we are, as human beings, we are naturally negative. Some of you even have negative blood, right? Uh, but we are naturally negative, but not only that, we we live in a society that, that everything seems to be negative. 
You know, you look at the news. And, and so what, what was the headline this morning on the news? It was this fatal car crash down on I-95 that closed down the freeway for, for hours and hours. And, and it's always some bad news. On, on, there's war and, and murder and rape and pillage and, and robbery and, and all kinds of bad news. Even when you get to the weather, then it's a 20% chance of rain. Hey, well, what about the chance 80% that it won't, you know? They don't ever talk about that. And then they get to talking about unemployment. For 2013, uh, about 7% unemployment. There were 93% of us that had a job. Uh, that's the good news, but we, we just automatically, we're, we're just bombarded with what's wrong with everything. And so by nature and by our conditioning, we are a negative, complaining people. The Israelites, were compl they complained for 40 years. And some of us have been married a long time. Uh, we may say that our husband or our wife have been complaining for 40 years, just like, just like the Israelites. But you see, Christians are to be different. And that's what Paul was talking about in Philippians 2.14. We've already read this twice this morning. And I, I really like it when our young men read Scripture. I think that's good. And they do such a wonderful job. But let's read it again. Patrick read it. He had some great comments. Patrick, I may get you to preach this sermon for me uh, with, uh, with the comments you made. It was good. But let's read verses 14 again from Philippians chapter 2. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. And so today, I thought about calling this uh, sermon Conquering Complaining. Then I thought, well, no, I need to be more positive than that. Uh, and, and so I called it Rejoicing Without Complaint. So how do you rejoice without complaint? Well, uh, before we get to the how to do it, I want us to talk about four common types of complainers. And the first one is the whiner. It's not fair. These people, they wake up negative. They, they rise and whine. Some of, they even have a bumper sticker that says, I will rise, but I refuse to shine. Uh, you know, David whined a little bit in the Psalms, didn't he? He said in Psalm 23, I, have I been wasting my time? Why have I taken all the, the trouble to be pure? Because I'm not getting anything out of it. All I get is trouble and, and woe. How come the bad guys are prospering and I can't get any of that? He was, he was a little bit of a whiner and some of that stuff. But the telltale sign of the whiner is it's not fair. And, and we hear that from our kids, but we also hear it from adults, don't we? Do you remember in Matthew chapter 20, uh, Jesus told about a landowner. He said the landowner went out to find some workers, and he went out at the sixth hour, and he found some, and he promised to pay them a denarius, and they were glad to get it. And, and so they went out and worked, and then he found some more at the ninth hour, he found some more at the eleventh hour, and then when it came time to get paid, the ones at the eleventh hour got a denarius, but the ones that had gotten there at the six hour, and they began to complain. Say, look, we worked hard all day out in the sun, and then these people come and work for an hour, and they get the same as me. It's not fair, right? And so, but what did Jesus say? He said, look, you agreed. That's, you, you were willing to work for a denarius, and it's my money, so why shouldn't I pay them what I want to pay them? I could get, he didn't say this, but he's, I could give it to him if I wanted to. But we had an agreement. So just stick to your agreement and quit complaining. That's basically the message. Life is not fair, folks. Well, we know that. The life is not fair. And Jesus himself said that, marvel not that the world hates you because it hated me. It's going to hate you too. Life is not fair. 
Another place in Scripture says that those who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Is it fair for you to be persecuted? No, but that's what life, life is not fair. So do you know any whiners? Are you one? You know, what my grandchildren used to, they don't do it anymore, but when they come to my house, I want this, I'm, I'm, you know, I want this and I want that and he got this. And, and I, I finally said, no whining at Papa's house. <laughs> now you can whine at home if your parents will let you, but when you come to Papa's house, there's no whining. If you want something, tell me in a, in a understandable and grateful voice and I'll get it for you but I'm not going to respond to any whining. And that's a rule at my house. No whining at Papa's house. Kathy hadn't caught on to that rule yet, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I want her to know I said that, I'll tell her, okay? <laughs> the second kind of complainer is the martyr. No one appreciates me. In Numbers chapter 11, God has allowed Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And he has provided for them. He, he helped them escape uh, through the Red Sea from the Egyptian army. He has given them clothes that, and shoes that will not wear out. And he's been providing manna, something good to eat. And he gave them all the goods. The Egyptians just gave them all this gold and silver and everything they needed to take with them. They had animals. Uh, they had things to, uh, to take with them. And God was providing manna. But then they start complaining after a while. We wish we were back in Egypt. We had vegetables there. And here all we got is this loathsome manna every day. We won't meet. And they kept on Moses, and Moses finally says, Lord, why are you picking on, why did you give me these people to take care of them? I can't handle all of this whining and complaining all the time. Why don't you just, if you're going to do this to me, just go ahead and kill me. It would be a, it would be a blessing if you just go ahead and kill me. Do, why don't you let me out of this impossible situation? And we know the Lord gave them meat, and then they got sick of it. And then they found something else to complain about. But the people who are martyrs, who say, no one appreciates me, like Moses was, uh, they are pros at having pity parties. You know people who have pity parties. Well, I've been sick. And I was sick, and you didn't come see me. You didn't call me. Do you ever find yourself grumbling and complaining and being a martyr in this way? How do you react when you don't get your way? Do you, do you mount a complaint campaign? Do you whine and argue and you debate? Our young people do that. But mom and dad, all the other kids get to do it. All the other kids get this item or that item. Why, why are you picking on me? Why can't I have everything that they have? The martyr. Another category of complainers. But then there's the cynics. Nothing will ever change. Solomon was a little bit like that in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. He said, life is useless. You spend your life working and what do you have to show for it? The world just stays the same. Reminds me of an old song back in the day of Tennessee Ernie Ford, the 16 tons, you know, uh, talking about working in the coal mines. You load 16 tons and what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. A cynic. Nothing ever changes. Uh, he went on to say, Solomon went on to say, uh, the world stays just the same. What has been done before will be done again. And I think they were probably talking about picking up after the kids, right? Or dusting that shelf. You know, you dust it and, and why dust? Because the next day it's got dust on it again, you know? But then it's, nothing will ever change. The cynic. 
And then there's the perfectionist. And their mantra is, is that the best you can do? It should have been done better. It's a, it's a nagging time kind of complaint. Nothing is ever good enough for the perfectionist. Several years ago, there was a movie out called Sleeping with the Enemy. I think Julia Roberts was, was the female star in that. But her husband was such a, he was psychotic was his perfectionism. He had to have the towels in the bathroom, two towels, hanging exactly the same length with no wrinkles and exactly the same distance from the edge. All the glasses, all the dishes in the kitchen, there could not even be a water spot on the sink. Every... I tell you, someone married to a perfectionist, whether it's male or female, must be the most miserable person in the world because they're complaining about nothing you do is right. In Proverbs 27 and 15, the Bible says, a nagging wife is like water going drip, drip, drip on a rainy day. In other words, it'll drive you crazy. A lady asked a waiter, buddy, do you serve crabs in here? He said, oh, ma'am, we serve everybody. <laughs> in Proverbs 21 and 19, better live in the desert than with a nagging, complaining wife. Now, that's true of husbands, too. Amen, ladies? Husbands can be that way, too. <laughs> I appreciate the amen. I thought I'd get some. One man came in and said, I am dog tired. She said, well, no wonder you've been growling all day. <laughs> Complainers. Nothing destroys the warmth of a home more than complaining. Nothing destroys the harmony of a marriage more than complaining. Nothing hinders the production at work more than complainers. Nothing destroys the peace and the harmony and unity of a church. Nothing more than complaining. And the problem is, nagging doesn't work. Does nagging work on you? Then why do you do it for other people? You know, why do you do it to other people? If it doesn't work on you, it's not going to work on them. That's the, it does not work. It just makes everybody upset when we do it. So, let, parents, let me ask you. Do your, parent, uh, do your children complain a lot? They complain all the time. Where did they learn it? If they do, where did they learn it? Make a family pact like I have. Complaining is not permitted in this house. You're going to have so much better harmony and joy in your home if you eliminate complaining. So how do we conquer it? How do we overcome it? How do we rejoice instead of complaining? Well, number one, admit it's a problem. For you, not for the other people. Admit it's a problem for you. In Proverbs 28 and 13, the Bible says a person who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. I think one of the most difficult things in handling complaining is recognizing it in ourselves. And all the excuses we proffer instead of admitting that we're complainers. Well, I'm not... I'm just, I'm a person of discernment, you know. Or I'm not complaining, I'm just showing you where things need to be improved. If someone were to record you for a week, what would those recordings tell everybody about your speech, about your demeanor? So first, if you're going to get over complaining, you've got to admit that it's a problem for you, and you may be sitting here right now saying this is a good sermon for my kids. This is a good sermon for my husband or my wife or my coworkers. But I'm talking to you today, individually. Are you a complaining? What about you? Complaining is a sin. Now I know it's a sin because the Bible says right here in Philippians 2, do everything without it. And if you do everything with it, then that's contrary to scripture, right? 
Complaining is a sin that needs to be confessed and overcome. So go ahead and, and confess it. Remember what it said in Proverbs 28, a person who refuses to admit his mistakes will never be successful. Complaining was the sin that kept the Israelites out of the promised land for 40 years. More than seven times it says that they murmured. Another word for complaint. And so, number one, if we're going to rejoice instead of complain, we need to admit it's a problem. And number two, accept responsibility for my own life. A lot of times complaining is just an attempt to blame other people. The old blame game, right? The problems I've created, I, I need to blame somebody else for it. It's, it's, it's an attempt to shift the focus to someone else. The Bible says in Proverbs 28 and 19, some people ruin themselves by their own stupid mistakes and then blame God. Friends, if you don't like the way the ball is bouncing, you shouldn't have dropped it. Right? We, we blame all of our problems on somebody else, some other person or, or blame it on God, but when we were the ones that caused the problem in the first place. When I bring problems into my own life, I have no legitimate gripe or complaint to make if I'm the one who did it. And, and the Bible teaches us we reap what we sow. So maybe your problems that you may be having that you're complaining about is because of what you have sown. And now you're reaping what you sowed. As Patrick pointed out earlier, we are free to choose what we want to do and who we want to be. If we are complainers, we have chosen to be complainers. Nobody's forced us into it. It's something we have chosen to do. And, and so I want to choose to be a person of joy and happiness. And I don't want to complain. Now, sometimes I still do. It's like that old Eagle song, life is good. I can't complain, but sometimes I still do. That's what the song says. And, and, and so, because we're human, we still do. But I want to eliminate that from my life, from my vocabulary, from my speech. You know, I hear so many people grumbling about being in debt. I have no money, and I owe my soul to the com company store, as the song says. But it could it be, perhaps, that you have been irresponsible in your spending and saving? One couple came to a preacher and they were down and out. They had no money. And under investigation he found out they had spent $800 on things they didn't really need and then they both quit their jobs. It, this is just a part of our entitlement mentality that we've got in our society. We think we deserve having a house and a car and, and food on the table when we don't have to work for it and we don't have to, to manage what we do have. Maybe the reason we are in trouble financially is because we haven't managed it properly. And I really appreciate our benevolence committee, when they help somebody with money or something else, they try to sit down and help them manage what they do have so that they won't run out and so they won't have to be a, a, a burden on somebody else. God has given us the freedom to choose who we, who we are and what we do. But even though we are free to make that choice, we are not free from bearing the consequences of the choices that we make. And so when we make a choice that brings problems, we have no legitimate reason to complain. Somebody says, well, I'm not appreciated at home. Well, maybe you are reaping what you sow. If you don't show appreciation, then you may not reap appreciation. And it's that way in any aspect of our life. If, if you want friends, you must show yourself friendly. The Bible tells us that. If you want to be appreciated, then you've got to show appreciation. If you want love, then you've got to demonstrate love. You reap what you sow. 
And so there's three kinds of, uh, of complainers here. That is uh, in this category, the accusers, the excusers, and the choosers. The accusers accuse somebody else of being the, the root of the problem. The excusers excuse themselves from, from having any responsibility. And the choosers say, I choose to rejoice and not complain. But then number three, we need to develop an attitude of gratitude. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The reason I can be thankful in all circumstances is because of what it says in Romans 8 and 28, all things work together for good for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. A lot of people are not grateful for what, they're, what they have. They're not grateful for their husbands or their wives or their children or their homes and, and so on. I had uh, some customers at, at the store where I work and they came in often and, and I, I really liked them. They were, they were good customers and they liked uh, me and they liked the service they got at that store. But it seemed like every time they were in, she was saying something negative about her husband. And when she'd come in by herself, she'd say something about the old coot, uh, maybe not in that, those words, but he'd, they'd, he'd say, she would say something about him. And then all of a sudden, he got sick and he died. I have never seen a person so distraught at losing their husband. I think she realized she didn't appreciate what she had when he was still there. The old thing is we don't appreciate the water until the well runs dry. And so we need to get an attitude of gratitude. Paul said in Philippians 4 and 11, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now what does that mean, learning to be content? It means I'm grateful for what I do have. I am not focusing on what I don't have. I am grateful for what God has given me. I'm grateful for what I have and not worrying about what I don't have. And, and we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? All of us, no matter what our economic condition is, we have so much to be thankful for. It doesn't mean that you have to like everything that comes your way. It does mean, though, that you need to find the good in what comes your way. And, and the good is going to last a lot longer than the problem is going to last. The good that you find in it. Christians are to be different in their outlook. And we need an attitude of gratitude. You know, when we uh, have a circumstance, we need, number four, to look for God's hand in those circumstances. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is a great scripture. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. I know a lot of you have your, your phones and your iPads and so on with the Bible on it, but I still like to hear those pages turning. In verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 4, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul is telling us that the problems that come our way the way you look at them will determine who you are. The way you look at them will determine your attitude about life, will determine your attitude about, uh, about God, will determine your attitude about other people, how you look at them. Look, look for the good in those things. Uh, look for God's hand in those circumstances. The reason we're told not to complain, I think, is that Complaining, in essence, is rebellion against God. Had you ever thought about that? 
when we complain, we are questioning God's wisdom. We're saying, well, if I were God, I'd do it different. Right? If I were God, I wouldn't treat me this way. Uh, complaining is questioning God's wisdom. God said in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11, my words will not return to me void. They will fulfill the desire of my heart. That's the wisdom of God. We need to listen to him. Number two, when we complain, we're doubting God's care. Cast your care upon him for he cares for you. When I complain, I'm questioning God or doubting God's care for me. And when I complain, then I'm forgetting about God's goodness. God provides everything that we need, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. All blessings can be found in Jesus Christ, the scripture tell us. You know, in my own, own life, I'm convinced, I, you know, I told you I still do complain sometimes, and, I, and I, I want to stop it. But most of the things I complain about, I think God knows that I need to have those things. Sort of like Paul and his thorn in the flesh. Paul pray, prayed three times that he remove his thorn, and, and God said, my grace is sufficient for you. I think he's saying, Paul, you need that thorn to make, to make you humble. And I think he's saying to me, whatever I'm complaining about, Don, you need that to make you humble. And so we need to remember that God's hand is involved in all of the circumstances. And we need to find the good there. But then, so if we're going to rejoice instead of complaining, we need to admit the problem. We need to accept responsibility. We need to develop the attitude of gratitude. We need to look for God's hand in the circumstances. And then number four, five, we need to practice speaking positively. You know, complaining is a habit, and habits are broken by replacement. We, re we get rid of negative speaking by learning to speak positively. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be beneficial but that it may benefit those who listen. Whatever we say needs to be a benefit to someone. We need to build people up and not tear them down. We need to use positive language. Remember the old thing that if you can't say something good about somebody, just don't say anything? Words that build up and encourage. Now, while we're in Ephesians, look at verse 4. Here's a message to fathers. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and, and instruction of the Lord. How do you exasperate your children? I think by being negative. When we're training our children, we need to be positive with them. Practice positive speaking. Now, Paul tells us in our text in Philippians chapter 2 that there are three results of not complaining. Number one, he says you will be blameless. Nobody can find fault with you when you, when you are not a complainer. Number two, if you don't complain, you'll be found to be pure. You will, have a, you will be a person of integrity. And number three, you'll shine like a star. Positive people shine like a star. You want to be a star in life? Then stop complaining. Stop murmuring. Christians are to react differently to the circumstances in life. And the complaining Christian is a bad witness. Think about that. A complaining Christian is a bad witness. My vision for this church is, will be a church that makes a difference. And one of the ways that we can make a difference is have a, a number of our members who shine like stars in this dark and diverse generation. I'm asking you today to be a star. Be a star. 
And remember, to be a star, you must shine your own light as you bear the light of Jesus in your life. You must follow your own path as you're led by the Holy Spirit. And then you don't have to worry about the darkness of this world because that when, is when the stars shine the brightest. Friends, if you want your life to shine for Jesus, you have to have him in your life. You have to give your life to him. You have to make him Lord of your life. And so if you need to do that, I ask you to come now while we stand and sing together. Oh, so are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the same.